Okay, everyone. My name is Marco, and I'm a software engineer at Symfony. Uh, I've been doing like a lot of stuff in web since 2010. Uh, okay, just one second. Cool, this works. Okay, so Roman just mentioned how it's a bit you know hard to switch, and you have like React, and you have a lot of different projects written in different kinds of uh, of structure, like using Redux or Mobix or without any global state management. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today and how we can solve that. So the topic is climate change of the React ecosystem. And let's see how we can make our application sustainable while, while you know, not <laughs> messing up the, the projects that we're working on. So first, a little bit of history, how it all started. Like in 2009 and 2010, the node got released and the package manager for it and the modular JS came to be. Like, uh, a lot of stuff that, that we had, like, uh, I mean, everybody got tired of jQuery and global overrides and different styles that you could actually, uh, you know, I mean, it was really, really easy to break your application, especially in large teams and in large, large setups that you wanted to build. So everybody jumped on board, like, for Angular and Backbone were, were the first frameworks that used that modular JS to actually uh, create uh, <laughs> compiled and uh, encapsulated browser uh, JavaScript applications. Um, but then, <laughs> like, uh, Amber came to be in 2011, then Mitriel and CanJS and a lot of new frameworks just started popping up like daisies. And all of us just jumped on the train and created our, our own implementations of modular JavaScript and the right ways to actually build our applications. So, and <laughs> that was the, the dark age of, of JavaScript frameworks. Look, it was really, really, it was way harder to, cho to just choose the framework and go about building your application than actually, like, the, the problems that business requirements were, were about to, to solve. So a lot of times were wasted on just testing new frameworks, and a lot of projects failed or uh, fell behind because of this mess in, in JavaScript frameworks environment. So React, Facebook also jumped into the game in uh, 2013, no, May 2013, yeah? The first official version of React was deployed and open sourced. Uh, they wanted to help the community, but they actually built some internal uh, ads manager or internal applications that are actually used on Facebook. So th uh, they needed a system, and they created an internal tool that, that actually solves a lot of those problems. And they decided to, op to open it up to the community and to see what, what comes next. Uh, React was never really a framework. It, it's a templating library that actually does client-side rendering uh, perfectly. Like they did a really good job optimizing all of this stuff. And they didn't really care where the data or the user inputs came from. Like it was a bit of a par paradigm shift, like you saw in the view examples. You had your template files, you had your JavaScript, your CSS. Everything was combined into single uh, component uh, and a file with only using JSX. Like if anybody's coding with React, you definitely know what I'm talking about. Uh, the focus was on the rendering and the performance of, of, the, of our applications. Uh, single page applications also became a thing. So everything was bundled in, in simple JavaScript that was executed in the browser. Um, they really did a good job on it. And a couple of years later, they separated the React core from React Dome and React Native uh, for usage on different environments. A uh, year after, they released React Fiber that was really a complete uh, rewrite of the core React uh, Reconciler about uh, the, the comparing of the virtual DOM and the shadow DOM they used internally. Uh, applications just felt really, really fast, and it was really nice working with it. Uh, and that's kind of the, the time when the industrial age of the, of the JavaScript frameworks came to be. It was really like nice and pleasant to work on. on different kind of uh, business problems, and you, you, it was easy to choose one solution and just go about doing your application. You didn't have to worry. You didn't have to go in, inside your node modules and debug things. It was a, a nice time. Uh, modular CSS also came to be, so all of the rewrites that we actually had, like uh, overriding like global classes, it was it was thing of the past. So you can just you know go and build your stuff. 
uh, Redux came to be like the go-to system for global state because React didn't really manage the global state on, on, on the application level. And nobody really ever wondered, like, will something work with, with Internet Explorer? And last year, like, they had the JSConf, yeah, the JSConf in Iceland last year in March. Uh, they gave, like, the first hints of what's to come in, in React. Like, this is, like, after, like, a couple of years of everybody just doing their, their applications. They announced suspense, and they announced they're gonna so they're gonna solve the server-side rendering part of the of the applications. So the release 16.3 uh, brought out the the op they opened up the context API. Like n nobody really cared that much about it because we were already using Mobix or, or Redux, and Redux was already hooking into uh, their internal context, like in a hacked way for a couple of years already, and it, it all worked. So this release wasn't really that much, didn't brought that much noise and things like that. But you st started hearing some new terms in, in the community, like the high order components or render props, or you could bound your template file into try and catch blocks with error boundaries. Uh, they also introduced portals so you could actually mount your uh, small widget, React widgets outside of your in entire application tree. That was a nice change, but like, who would ever, you didn't really have like the, the need to go about and changing stuff. And then, yeah, the Iceland and JS conf happened. Uh, Dan Abramo was uh, importing a lot of stuff from the future package, and uh, they started introducing the notion of a synchronous rendering for all of our applications. Uh, it was really nice to see like a lot of loaders, delayed loaders, for each section of your application, uh, but it was an unstable API. It just brought like a hint of what's to come. Um, they introduced code splitting and lazy lo loading for all of our widgets and pages. Uh, and they introduced like a IceandJSConf was in March, and they in April they announced the React hooks. The hooks were, like, up until then, uh, you either had, like, a simple, simple function that actually is going to render some HTML to the DOM, or you should have, uh, if you wanted some user interaction and held in the events, you, you had to create, like, a complete class, like a component class that's going to follow through all of the user inputs that, that, you know, users are triggering all over the application. And they kind of mentioned that writing classes is boring, <laughs> but... And they wanted to solve that that thing with and a lot of boilerplate with hooks. So uh, they also like the hooks are the uh, brought like the stateful uh, compo simple components to the to the market actually. Um, and the promise of solved server side rendering was like the the gold pot at the end of the rainbow. <clears throat> a lot of changes. Like the last year was actually a lot of announcements that are the things that, that, that's gonna come to the React ecosystem. Uh, in the meantime, like Angular 2 came out and everybody, you know, started using that. Vue was getting really hyped up, and a lot of new stuff was ho uh, going on, like CSS and JS and TypeScript. Really proven its worth in uh, in a large, large teams and large applications, and it was. Like a lot of stuff, but if you wanted to implement it, you had to take a step back. Everybody had to learn the syntax and just move forward. After that, uh, Webpack 4 came out. They changed the configuration file a bit. Uh, Babel 7 got introduced, and you could uh, split your plugins for it and use it independently, like depending on, on what you actually want to use in your application and what you need. And everybody uh, had to, you know, take a couple of days from coding and rewrite your configuration. Uh, prepare your browser, uh, RC lists, Babel plugins, things like that, just to keep up with all the all the changes. Uh, and the notion of the tech depth in front end was introduced. Like you kind of felt you are falling behind from all of the rest of the, you know, community just because you're still using some old kind of old code. Uh, so a lot of changes, a lot of things happened, and how. We should uh, how to make sense of, of all of that confusion that came about in the last year. Uh, you have your projects, you have your 
uh, like features that you have to build, the deadlines are there, like you, you should ask your management and your, like your bosses to give you time to set aside to actually implement the new stuff and, and the new uh, syntax and things that it actually the library offers. And it was a bit overwhelming, like because you, you always had to switch uh, to calculate in all of the rewriting time with all the new set of features that you had to deliver for the for the deadlines. Uh, luckily, we have a five-point action plan how we can actually manage all of the, those situations. So the first one is uh, no die product. Like, don't lose focus. If you have a if you're doing agile, agile and uh, sprints and things like that, you cannot really uh, set aside the time to just go a couple of days and transfer everything to the new system that, that the library is offering. You have to uh, make sure that, that the product doesn't suffer. We had that situations in, in, the, in the early 2010s when everybody just you know, started to use new frameworks and the projects were suffering. We didn't want that again. So you had to make sure you understand the feature requirements. They are uh, really, really deeply in, uh, described, and the environment, uh, environment requirements of where your application is going to run. Do you have to support TN9 or things like that? Uh, to to actually create a like the action plans are the the way to to go. You have to agree with all of your uh, managers and teams and designers how to actually go about rewriting your parts of application into the new system. Uh, you had to know your runtime pitfalls, like uh, these features are fairly new, so you had to understand if you have to you know, render a, a lot of graphs or diagrams or things like that. You had to make sure that, actually, that your application is going to work when you, go, when you deploy to production. And you, you, now you, I mean, you had to respect your deadlines and you have to bring the, the value to the product with these rewrites. Um, to answer all of those questions, you have to, I mean, to answer all, of th these are the questions that you have to answer if you want to go about rewriting your entire application. So are you solving like the existing problem that actually your user fa users face day to day? Is it a performance issue? Is it a UI or UX issue? If uh, things are, re if you really want to help, help people easily use your, your service. Uh, the second question is, uh, are you completely sure that you can develop and transfer all of that code to the new system in time for all the deadlines that, that you have to you know, respect? And the third one is, are you willing to bet your one month salary on the new set of features that you're going to deploy to production? Like, if all of those questions, like if the answer to all of those questions is yes, then just go about it. It's going to be fun, it's gonna, you're going to learn something new, and you can actually bring some new uh, uh, things there or rules of thumb that you're actually going to use throughout your, your pr project building. <clears throat> the second point is know thy team. So not everybody on your team are on the same level of knowledge or uh, are really hyped up about the new things, and you have to make sure that everybody understands why the rewrites are, are there. Uh, if, if the team just don't agree about going about the rewrite, you should maybe set aside some time to explain, okay, so these are the new features that actually can bring benefit to all of us in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, code is for coworkers, it's not for compilers. That's the, the, basically the point of, of actually the, doing the rewrite. And you have to find your minimum common denominator, like to agree the set of rules that everybody's gonna respect while you build a new project, new product. Uh, action plans are really the news, uh, I mean, it's the phrase that you have to use a lot. Like, uh, you have to have your uh, meetings with the team before you start developing things. You have to set the ground basis, like, okay, you're gonna do this, you, uh, you have to create uh, corresponding JIRA tasks or, or assign it to the right person, and when you have, like, a whole implementation up front, you know, planned, it's gonna be easy to, to just go and deliver it. Uh, and if you hit a wall while you rewrite your component or a feature, it's actually a good thing because you're gonna discover how you can solve all of the, the stuff and prevent your colleagues from hitting the same wall. Uh, next point is minimize external dependencies. Like when the synchronous rendering came to be and the promise of, of service-side rendering, 
uh, is like uh, hopefully we're all going to build our, I mean, we're all going to server render our applications by the end of the year when the suspense, stable suspense uh, release got, got released. Um, that actually meant like bye bye Redux forms, bye bye a lot of external dependencies that, I mean, everybody's going to um, use the context API to create your own reducers and your own provider. And like the dependencies that actually were tied to Redux or Mobix or whatever, will probably if you want to be ready for server-side rendering, you should start minimizing those dependencies inside your your projects. Uh, if anybody checked like the the node module size lately, it gets up to one gigabyte. Do we really need like that much of JavaScript to run our applications to create it to create our applications? Uh, even if you don't care about the server-side rendering. Users will really appreciate the faster load times and uh, the faster re the, the, the responsiveness of the application with the new set of tools. Um, and yeah, to reduce those external dependencies, you uh, go to, to Babel. Babel has a lot of set of uh, good plugins that, that uh, allow you to write uh, the new syntax and new features of the, of the mere JavaScript language without worrying will it work on, on EA 10 or EA 9, depending, or on mobile, mobile devices, depending on what, what you actually use. Uh, stick to the stack version. This actually means that when you go into a rewrite and you, you want to use hooks inside your application, you have to set aside at least a week or two to just figure out where the files are going to be, what's going to be the naming convention, um, especially if you're already working on, on a, uh, if you're not starting new, you already have some setup for the Redux store, the reducers actions, and you have to make uh, those changes in parallel. So the first week or two is just going to be uh, laying out the structure of all of the files, and you, uh, well, I mean, Re React is really good in mixing apples and oranges, so it's not going to be an issue, but initially, the, the features like the ho hooks are released, uh, were re released in February, so it's still fresh and new, and there, there isn't really a, a guideline to, okay, so you put your actions here, you put your hooks files here. Like, you have to figure that out yourself, and you have to figure it out that it's gonna be beneficial to all your colleagues and, and you and the product eventually. Uh, start with small features, like choose a small set of features that are gonna, um, that you're going to rewrite, and uh, like rewriting a couple of small features initially is going to help you create that system and that you, like your stack version of the of the React impl implementation, and it's going to be a lot easier to transfer the complicated components to the smaller ones when you already have like the initial setup for for the for the small ones. Um, when you when you you know like rewrite your small feature, make sure you choose like the one that's not really used that much or doesn't have a lot of data interaction. Uh, test it like stress test it uh, before production, and when you deploy it, just move to the next one and so on until you get to the big, bigger ones. And communicate and follow through. This actually means that you you have to like. Refractors are sometimes like a business decision if you want to sell your company on the, on the stock exchange. Uh, sometimes you just attack debt. Like it's, uh, the, performance, uh, the performance of your application is really slow or users are suffering from that side. So uh, you, know, uh, you have to sell that story to your managers to get the time to actually refactor all of that, all of that stuff. And the communication is the key in, in that section. Like, uh, set aside a meeting. Nobody likes meetings, but actually, you, you will have to, you know, set aside time for them to talk to your managers, to talk to your designers. Maybe the business requirements changed in the meantime for that feature that you want to rewrite. Or, uh, like, design changes are c coming up, so you can actually implement tho those while you do the, the refactor of the JavaScript section and create action plans and small steps again. Uh, the features are fairly new, so you're definitely going to hit a wall at some point. Just communicate immediately to, to your teams. Like, even if you search for some issues on Google, like React did a really, really good job in the last year uh, describing their error messages, so it's, it's really clear where the error happened. But still, you don't have to waste time um, Googling and searching for issues because you're probably not going to find anything like consistent, talk to your team, make a, a decision together about how to go about 
solving the issue and move forward. Um, that's it. I mean, the React is backward compatible since the first version. So even your uh, latest features, like your ap applications that are written in, in like five years ago, they're still going to work with the current version. Uh, deprecation notices are there, but you don't really have to think about it. So, and it's a, it's a good library to, you know, work <laughs> dynamically in, <laughs> it's a really good library. Like, uh, the changes that they are bringing to the, to the system, it's just going to bring us benefits in the next year. So just uh, try to prepare your applications like they announced and wait for the suspense and the rendering uh, on the server. That's bring, I mean, it's going to bring all of the benefits for, for the SEO and even for the users. Uh, and they've proven that applications can actually be written stably even though the environment is, is dynamically changing all of, all of the time. Um, Q&A. Yeah. <laughs> this is a bit fast. I mean, it's a simple set of rules that you actually can use each day in your day-to-day -day work to uh, avoid, you know, having issues and encountering some some new stuff. And like, you use this set of features, and you like each day at 5 p.m. you can go and have your beers. Like, it's not it's not going to be an issue. Question? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so a uh, question uh, regarding uh, state management in React. Uh, me personally, uh, I have been using Redux mainly, and you already mentioned the React Context API. It's become finally stable because earlier it was marked exp experimental. Yeah. yeah. And uh, now with Context API, you can do some state management and uh, uh, what is your experience? Did you do any state management with Context API? And uh, to which extent uh, the Context API can replace uh, Redux? Well, the, their idea is to replace it completely. Uh, like when Context API came out like experimentally, everybody just you know, went about to wrap your application, at least for like local changes, local state, um, locale actually, internet, internet utilization. Yeah. So you wrap your application, and you could just one click, pull new JSON of the locales, and all of the all of the texts were in new language, and that worked cool. But like, I was cautious and didn't deploy it to production. Like it was really a nice feature, but and now it's completely stable. Like you can write your own pr uh, provider, like the Redux provider, in like a hundred lines with all the comments. Uh, you, you can, like your if you want to compare like the React provider for the context, and the Redux, your reducers probably won't change at all. Like this, you can do the same system with uh, creating action providers and action types for all of your domains that you're going to use in the store. You write your provider in just one simple JSX file. You create one store, wrap your application. I, at the moment, like on the project that I'm actually working, I have the Redux provider, and inside it, I have the React provider. Just to, for, just to, I mean, I wanted to see how it works. And it's, it's working perfectly. Like um, we in this complete, like in this example, I'm having like the separate protected really page that's rendering the mix of some diagrams and things like that. So I wrapped it inside that provider that, ca that came from React. Uh, the only difference is going to be like you, you cannot use sagas, you cannot you cannot use tongues, but you can actually uh, using hooks and create like use use effect or or the using of the global state to create your own functions that are going to dispatch actions like exactly like in in sagas like in the saga you would dispatch like okay this is loading it's done trigger the the state update it's the same with hooks um, maybe i can give you some examples or things like that but like it's it's really easy it's going to the only difference is going to be your uh, synchronous actions should be written with hooks, and it's working re really, really, really OK. OK, thanks. So hopefully, we will get rid of one dependency. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Redux is, is a good thing. And even, I mean, Dan Abramo created it. But he's also like, 
not really <laughs> into it anymore. And internal state management with just React, it's it's going to be good because eventually, like I said, by the end of the year, we'll probably render all of the all of the application on, on the server. So fetching the data in uh, get default state from props or things like that, it's going to be a lot lot uh, easier to to you know just implement. It's going to be a flag. Okay, render it on the server or not. Like the server side rendering section is actually, uh, it's the SEO part of it. Uh, Google, when they index all of the pages that, that are actually like single page applications rendered on the client, they see that your content is not there and that they have to execute JavaScript to see all the content. And they postpone it, they put it into the queue, your website is uh, somewhere, and when they have like the processing time and things like that, then they execute it and index your pages that are actually public and rendered on the client side. Uh, it, it takes like three, four months. When I had like, I worked on an application that actually switched to um, client side rendering not knowing that it's going to affect the, the SEO part, and it took like four months before the pages got indexed. So you really have to, uh, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if your application is a public site, something like a commerce website or selling some, some things, server-side rendering still is like the, the big, big player in, in traffic, uh, in getting hits from Google. Like Bing, for example, they don't even execute JavaScript while indexing. Anything else? Like, hopefully, like uh, the presentation is going to be shared with everybody, and you can uh, ping me for the context for any any other questions or things like that. Yeah. Thanks.